and welcome to this Australia Papua New Guinea Network special event here at the Lowy Institute. My name is Jonathan Pryke and I'm director of the Pacific Islands program here at the Lowy Institute. I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to thank the supporters of the Australia Papua New Guinea Network project for their ongoing support, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and our event sponsors Bank South Pacific and Coca-Cola Amatil. We're pleased to be able to host this event today to talk about the biggest issue in the PNG Australia relationship at the moment, the global pandemic of COVID-19. Papua New Guinea has been particularly hard hit by the Delta variant of COVID-19 in recent weeks. An explosion of case numbers in the Highlands and the nation's capital has sent alarm bells ringing with the true picture of caseloads throughout the country remaining murky at best. To discuss the latest on COVID-19 in PNG, along with a number of other pressing issues for Australia's nearest neighbour, I'm pleased to be joined this afternoon by Gary Juffa, Governor of the Oro Province in Papua New Guinea. Governor Juffa was elected as Governor and a member of PNG's Parliament in 2012, and is leader of the People's Movement for Change Party. A prominent and outspoken member of the opposition through the Peter O'Neill years of government, Mr Juffa joined the Marape government in 2019. Being a member of the government hasn't stopped Governor Juffa from being an outspoken representative asking the tough questions on politics and governance, leadership and the environment. Gary Juffa, thank you for joining me. Now, Governor, we've caught you in a very unique position in Glasgow as part of PNG's official delegation to the COP26 negotiations. I do want to come back to climate change and what's going on on the ground in Glasgow in a moment, but instead want to start with a snapshot of how things are going back home. How is the current COVID situation on the ground going? What are the biggest challenges facing authorities in responding to this crisis? Well, firstly, the usual challenges that are facing all governments worldwide. Uh, for example, the capacity. You know, we just simply don't have enough health workers in, in all the electorates, in all the provinces, in all the districts, in all the hospitals, district hospitals, aid posts, and health centers. So that's, that's the first. Uh, secondly, is the information management or the management of the information space. Uh, I feel, and I have to admit, and I will probably be disciplined for this or rebuked for it, but the fact of the matter is, we have not managed the information space as well as we should have, you know. Uh, and had we done that, then you know you would be you would be ahead of the crowd in terms of basically informing them about what is going on. You know, in today's world where information is so readily available, the people can access information, misinformation and disinformation in, the, in an instant, you know, it's at their fingertips. And, and there are those who are mischievous and there are those who will, you know, uh, propagate false information, fake information, misinformation, disinformation deliberately. Uh, and it will be promoted with, with in, in great haste. And also the, the, the elements of influence in society, such as churches and community leaders, you know, youth leaders and tribal leaders, they need to have been engaged. And this did not happen as quickly as we ought to have, you know, and had we done that, then, you know, I think we would have seen greater vaccination rates. Uh, there's huge hostility to vaccines and primarily because people are suspicious because they don't know what's going on uh, and they don't know what's happening and what are the consequences and they're reading all this fake information false information misinformation disinformation and it's it's creating anxiety and you know hostility and you know uh, an aggressive hostile reaction to government efforts mm. it, it it does seem like misinformation is moving even faster than the virus is through through Papua New Guinea at the moment uh, and many, yeah. many people in PNG even don't even believe the the virus is, is real but you yourself had your own battle with COVID earlier this year. What would be your message to those that still don't believe in this virus? Well, it's very real. I mean, it, the, it, is, it is absolutely real. I, it was the worst experience I've ever had, you know, and I've never felt like, you know, this could be it. I know I'm, I'm saying this now, but at that time it was, I felt that, you know, and I'm, I'm a fairly healthy person. I, I manage my diet, I exercise and I, keep a you know, relatively uh, reasonable fitness regime. So if it affected me that way, I thought, man, it, it really affects a lot of other people differently, I'm sure, those who aren't so well, you know. But uh, I can tell them it's very real. And, you know, the, what, what a lot of people need to consider is the fact that they've got to be there for those who they are responsible for, you know. For myself, 
I, after getting it, I went and got vaccinated after the clearance was given by the doctors. And the reason for that was because I wanted to demonstrate that this is the responsible thing for you to do so that you can be there for your children, for your people, those who you love and care about and are responsible for. They need you around, you know. So if, if that, that's my message to the people, do that. Uh, and it's very real. I mean, four million plus deaths around the world is nothing to sneeze at. That's, that's no joke. You know, those are real people that died. That's not, those aren't fake coffins. Those aren't fake uh, dead bodies. Those are real dead bodies. Those are real people that have died and they've died from COVID, you know. And so what, what would be your message to, what, what are you, what conversations are you having with, with your government, with, with um, Prime Minister Marafe about what more the PNG government can be doing to help turn this misinformation around, turn this vaccine hesitancy around? I've said this many times. I'm sounding like a broken record. Myself <laughs> and Bird and a few others have been saying this. Manage the information space. You know, get a team of people that are going to be sitting on social media countering this misinformation, disinformation, just responding to it, everything and anything, just hammering it home. This is an information war that we're fighting and we are losing this war. Fight that war with information, relevant, factual, easily understood information, you know, and, and, and do it in a way where people will be satisfied that you're not bullshitting them, that you're not, you know, trying to pull the wool over their eyes, but give them facts, details, and get credible people to do it, get doctors to do it, scientists to do it, you know, and people who they would look up to, religious figures, for instance, get them to come and, and engage with them. You know, I mean, it's not too late to fight this war and win, but it, an effort needs to be made, you know, and you, you, you may need to spend some serious money, but, you know, you're going to save lives. Uh, that's the message I've been uh, giving. And also, you know, we've got to also understand that as much as possible, maintain health services because the other diseases aren't going to take a break, you know. Malaria, pneumonia, and TB, and all these guys aren't going to say, you know what, COVID's here, we're going to take a break for a little while. No, they won't. They, they're going to keep marching. So you've got to treat those as well. So to do that, the district hospitals and aid post health centers need to be fully equipped uh, and, and your staff, the healthcare workers who have been such an ignored lot for too long, they've been ignored, they haven't, their pay hasn't improved significantly, their benefits aren't you know, in place they've got to be seriously taken care of. You know, if anything, this is a huge wake up call. Uh, and also it's, a, it's an opportunity to review our defunct National Department of Health, which has been deteriorated and has been decimated by corruption for so many years that it, it is basically uh, not a responsible functioning entity as it ought to be providing to the expectations of our people. Yeah, the, the health the health system is uh, an issue, an area that you've been so vocal on for such a long period of time in your in your career as a politician in, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, what do you think would be the first steps in turning around the, the the country's health system and cleaning up misappropriation of funding and corruption you've been speaking about? What would be the first steps? Well, the first steps would be to look at the public accounts committee reports that were tabled, and they were not, not just the final report, but reports that were tabled along the way during the inquiry. And we shone the spotlight on the procurement committee and the processes involved. And we, we identified the individuals, you know, and, and nothing has been done about this. You know, nothing has been done about those individuals. We identified the companies that were involved in, in corrupt dealings and nothing has been done. In fact, many of these companies are still operating, still engaged, still providing, uh, barely providing, I would say, goods and services, and they're still there, you know? So something's got to happen about this. I would say that an emergency task force of some sort has to be set up. It, it probably shouldn't be the Department of Health overseeing this. The Department of Justice should be in charge. And we should bring good, credible people in and say, all right, we need to deal with this. Now, meanwhile, the procurement system under the uh, Public Sector Reform Committee, Public, Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reforms, which I chair, I have said, we're willing to create a space where donor agencies, development partners can come with together and establish a procurement system that can actually work and function for the people of Papua New Guinea. Because right now, National Department of Health has totally failed the people of Papua New Guinea. And not only has it failed them, but it's failing to correct the, 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 you know, the situation that it is in, even when we have highlighted that situation to them and delivered a set of recommendations as to how they can improve. Seems like very tangible first steps there, Governor. Now, the COVID crisis is developing in the shadow of a looming election scheduled for the middle of next year. 
with campaigning already in, in full swing up in, up in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the list the logistics started in 2012 what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> the logistics of undertaking like the logistics of undertaking in 2017 election. sorry that was the, the moment an election is over they already campaigned. you're already back They're at it over. i mean the logistics of the logistics of undertaking an election in papua new guinea are challenging in the best of circumstances uh, but what impact do you think COVID will have on the nation's ability to conduct elections next year uh, definitely challenging, many of which we can only predict, uh, you know, since we've never had COVID before, situation like COVID. But it, it will, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about these elections, to be honest. I, I don't know how we're going to manage them in such a way that we can deliver the results that the people deserve, you know. Uh, although it is said that people get the, you know, members they deserve because of how they vote, but that's another discussion. You know, um, in regards to the logistics, it's a nightmare. What happens is after every election, there should be an immediate review of the previous election. And there should be an effort to correct all the mistakes and put in place, you know, risk management strategies to ensure that these mistakes aren't repeated. That never happens. That never happens until the last moment. You know, the electoral commission is completely left alone and no one checks on them as to what they're really doing and that these reviews don't take place you know as far as i know uh, and you know i mean every year the election every election year the costs just escalate to a ridiculous amount and i mean we're staring at a massive you know budget for the elections and it's it's at a time when it's almost like blackmail you know if you don't pay this then guess what we might not deliver the elections that type of uh, you know, attitude is, is what I sense and it, it's worrying. And, uh, you know, I, I think if we haven't learned from the last elections, then we're in for a rough time. There'll be more violence, more deaths and uh, more elections that are going to be, I would very suspect, I would say. Well, yeah. let's all hope that that situation turns around quickly and, and a good time before the elections do take place. I mean, as you know, Bet, you, as you and I both know, all elections in uh, Papua New Guinea are local at the end of the day. It's all about local issues. But what do you think will be the bigger national issues that are going to help shape this, this election? Well, the people will look at how COVID was handled for sure. Uh, they will look at also commitments and promises made and whether those commitments and promises were kept or not. But again, that will be the, those who are you know, somewhat educated. Uh, the masses will still vote along tribal lines, clan lines. And that's, again, a, a, you know, always the danger. That's usually the big chunk of the voting population, how they think. You know? uh, pork barreling has already been in, you know, in process and progress since 2017. Uh, and, you know, they'll also be in the usual hotspots, the highlands, uh, certain parts of the highlands, there will be the, you know, possibility of uh, ballot box hijacking and intimidation and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, violence that goes with it, all of that will happen. Um, but, you know, we can be optimistic. We can hope for the best, but expect the worst. Well, I'm personally going to keep hoping for the best. Uh, Governor, I, yeah. I now want to shift this conversation from, from talk about one crisis uh, to another, and in many, in many ways, a more intimidating crisis, that of climate change. You've recently arrived in Glasgow mm. for the COP26 climate change negotiations. Um, how do you see climate change affecting your people and affecting Papua New Guinea going forward? Papua New Guinea has been a victim of climate change for a long time. And uh, in that one, we are seeing the disappearance of our coastal areas, our atolls. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to accommodate the first climate refugees uh, in, in transporting people from uh, the, the Cataract Islands to mainland, you know, so that they could resettle because the Cataract Islands are no longer livable. Uh, the saline has affected the island to such a degree that you can't plant crops there, you can't live there anymore. You know? uh, then you've got issues such as the flooding that's taking place in you know, river uh, areas where rivers are. And, and these floods are no longer the normal types of floods that uh, people were accustomed to and could predict and could manage. These floods are different, you know, they are very devastating, they're destructive. Uh, and then you've got king tides, you've got, we've seen firsthand a lot of 
the effects of climate change. You've seen global uh, temperatures rising in highland areas. So mosquitoes are now making their way up, uh, bringing with them all the diseases that they carry, you know, and the people in those areas are not um, immune to this disease. They don't have, uh, they haven't developed obviously uh, natural immunity yet. So they're prone to, uh, there's a lot of deaths taking place in these areas from these diseases brought up by these mosquitoes who can now migrate up that way. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's happening. You, you can sense that there's something going on and going wrong. Uh, coupled with that is the illegal logging that keeps taking place and no one's doing anything about that. We should also note here the governor's strong track record as a conservationist and advocate for PNG's forests and wildlife. Uh, to hear more on this topic, the governor will be talking on a panel in Glasgow next week on November 8th uh, called Exposing yeah. the Timber Mafia. Um, governor, do you want to give us a little hint at what you'll be talking about next week in that event? Well, basically, I want to highlight the fact that many of these companies are not companies at all. You know, we call them companies, we call them investors, they're not, they're organized criminal cartels, that's what I call them, that's what they are, you know, and I'll keep saying that, they are, they take me to court, in fact, they do take me to court, in fact, they've found a very clever way to use our court systems to tie us up, so I've been tied up in court uh, with all types of cases that they've thrown at me, and while I'm in court, the logs still, you know, get shipped out, because that's their agenda, they don't care about it. You know whether we're right or not. All they care about is shipping their logs out. You know, the millions and millions and of, of dollars worth of logs are leaving our shores. And if you dare to question them, first and foremost, the government systems that were established to protect PNG interests, and specifically in this space, forestry, uh, they're not going to step up and help you. They'll turn a blind eye. They'll look again away. In fact, not only that, they'll fight against you. They'll side with the cartels. That's because the cartels have basically compromised all these organizations. They own these organizations. These organizations no longer work for Papua New Guinea. They work for them, you know? And what's frightening is that these cartels are diversifying into other businesses. They're going into property. They're going into banking. They're going into all types of businesses. And, uh, you know, it, it, I would say it's like a covert recolonization program that they've undertaken and successfully, successfully. And the, the, their greatest success is the fact that not many people understand this or know this or care about it. Well, Governor, it sounds like that event next week is uh, one not to be missed. I look forward to being able to tune in myself. Oh, we have covered a lot of ground here today from COVID to the election to climate change. I wanted to end on a bit of a more personal note, Governor, if you will. Um, what message would you have for a young Papua New Guinean that might be tuning into this event and wondering how they can shape their country in these uncertain times? Look, your country, it's so worth saving. It is a beautiful country. It is blessed with the most amazing abundant resources that is the envy of countries worldwide. And it's so worth fighting for. And you have good people around you. They're good people that at all levels, at the village level, you know, at the educated level, at the youth level, at the elder level, there's good people. But what needs to happen is these good people can't keep standing up alone. They all need to come together and they all need to say, right, this country is so worth fighting for and they need to develop strategies as to how they're going to do this. And they've got to start thinking about politics. They've got to start thinking about the difference between politicians and leaders and work on getting leaders into parliament. There's a distinct difference. A politician is all about delivering classrooms and roads and bridges. You know, that's to him the minimum so he can get reelected. It's not thinking about the future too much. A leader will think about the future, a future where there can be prosperity, security, and opportunities for everybody and a safe, secure, natural environment to work in. Governor Jufa, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Jonathan. You have a great day. Thank you to Governor Jufa for joining us. And remember that we publish a daily news summary at our OzPNG Network website to help you keep tabs on the latest from Papua New Guinea. Thanks again to our event sponsors, BSP and Coca-Cola Amatil for their ongoing support for the OzPNG Network and to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for its ongoing financial support. We'll be back soon with another OzPNG Network event. I look forward to seeing you then.